Uh, my name's Oliver, um, I work for Citizen Project, um, and what I wanted to do today, what Elliot and I wanted to do, was address two rather large-scale community archaeology projects, and uh, I wanted to talk about the process of setting one up, really, on the scale that it is, and Elliot's going to talk a little bit about how you maintain something like this once we've got it going. So I'll spend the first five minutes, it's really going to be a bit of a description of the lessons learned from previous projects, we were born out of the Thames Discovery Programme. Um, and just some of the things that we've kind of understood as the best way to run the project based on working with a lot of different communities all around the coast of England. And um, it's probably quite helpful that it's come after all of the papers before because it might be a little different in the approach that we've found is working on this scale than for more localised events. Um, has anyone heard of Citizen before, I? Eh? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, well, we are the Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeological, uh, Archaeological Network. Um, we are three teams. We're based out of Museum of London uh, Archaeology Service in London. Uh, and uh, we have three teams of two people. Um, Meg and Andy are up at the back there. They represent the north of England. We have one in the southwest based in Portsmouth. And myself and colleague are based in London. Um, and all we have to do is work with the entire English coastline to monitor and record fragile and eroding archaeology. Um, we're not an excavation project, we're purely there to see what natural erosive processes can reveal about sites we already know, established sites, but also to see new ones um, and to record those in a way that is easy for our volunteers. It's rapid but provides useful information in the long term. And the way we've done that is develop a new app, a new smartphone app and a new web-based recording form, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a few slides. But one of the big challenges that we have, we have many small groups all around the coast and they all operate a little bit differently and they're all interested in very different things, um, which has been one of the key lessons. Um, two of the strongest points I think we should take today um, are that we had to plan hard and grow slow. Um, <laughs> no amount of planning that was done in advance of the project going live on such a scale um, could really account for just how many different ideas and groups that we had to deal with. Um, so what was really important is developing a really good core program and we took that again from the Thames Discovery Program. It's been running for seven years, the TDP, and they've got a very good way of dealing with uh, groups, community groups from all around London um, and a great training package over a number of days and we built on that package and we kind of got it sussed I think now we've got the model that we want and now we can start to grow the project but growing the project means that you need to be able to support a wide number of people and to do that you need to understand who those people are critically for us we need to be able to gauge what level of experience they have or have had before they come and be part of the project. And we do that through registration for the project. We now have well over 500 registered citizens through our website. Um, at least 250, round about there, have gone through training programs in the first year, and we have pretty much booked out our training sessions for this year all around the country. <clears throat> but to know what experience those people have had is very handy for us on site because it will allow us to give them specific roles or allow us to let them take charge where we feel that they can or can't or where they need to learn uh, from other people. And when we know what their experiences are, you can then seek to pitch accordingly, pitch your training accordingly, pitch your communications accordingly. So it's been really, really useful for us working on such a scale as to understand the people that we're working with a little bit more than uh, just inviting them to come along and getting straight in with it. And again, it goes down to utilising the skills, which is what I've really been saying. Um, managing their expectations um, is a very, very important thing because we're only six people and it's a very large area. So people, you need to be very clear. We've had to be very clear about what people will take from this project, but also what they will give to it, what they will provide, what their input will reveal for us. Um, people really want to learn. It's a very important aspect for them. So that's really what all of our sessions are around. It's about ensuring that people go away with a very defined list of skills and, and those list of skills will pray into, uh, feed into what I said pray into, that's <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, feed into what we're trying to achieve, which is the data we collect from our app. 
And for us, local knowledge is essential, and it's really important for us to let those local people, groups, individuals lead how we conduct this research. We've had to be very sensitive to local projects. Because we're on a national scale, we can't see to just parachute in and just perform some work over a weekend and then disappear. We have to support the work that's going on in that area and hopefully try to get those groups to uh, feed into what we're doing. Um, and for us, if this is to be sustainable, and um, we're a HLF project, sorry, I should have said, um, and we have three years of funding, but for in the long term, for us to be sustainable, um, those people have to be involved from the start. They need to feel that they own this project as much as we do, because ultimately it's about them. It's about giving them the opportunity to try something that they enjoy or to progress with something that they've had a lot of experience with and they want to take it into a, into a different environment, into the foreshore. I put a picture of this chap up because um, I was told to go and see him. He's called Robert Simper. Um, he said he'd written a fantastic book that I should go and, go and talk to him about. Um, it turns out Robert's written all the books. Um, <laughs> Um, but what Robert did in the meeting that we had with him is he produced almost an entire year's programme for us in his area. He'd been researching that for a long, long time. And what we have is a group of volunteers who are interested, and he is now going to lead that group. And that's really, really important that we, we kind of take that approach. Uh, feeding their enthusiasm. Um, we have a lot of people who really want to get go, and a lot of people really want to exco, <coughs> which we can't do. Um, so we need to... Oh, we, We've learned to kind of understand what it is that they're trying to take from the projects and maybe direct them towards um, sort of different areas of the coast that might suit their needs. So um, perhaps things where uh, areas where there is more constant erosion, so they're more likely to see uh, more archaeology revealed um, on a much more regular basis than perhaps looking around places like Burling Glap, where you have cliff fall over a sort of many months or after large storm events. Um, but understanding them and feeding their enthusiasm is good because we have to have a plan. This is the base of a shaft that was found on the beach, which you should check our website out about. It's really interesting. Um, but this group we formed, we have to have a plan because they immediately said when we got them to the end of this project, what next? What can we do next? And that momentum needed to be sustained for us. We need to be able to uh, feed them for the next three years. So really part of our preparation, which we've learned over this year, is to support and try to focus the variety of interests from the start and make sure there's something for them to go on to. And really that's where um, our app comes in. One more slide before I get to that. Um, personally, one of the things that I've noticed, and I, it's been said by a number of people I'm sure, is that um, the social aspects for the volunteers we have are as important, if not much more important, than the archaeology. A lot of the people we have coming down wanted to meet some people they wanted to do something new, they wanted to get out and about, and they wanted to try something. And it really gives them that opportunity. And the quote in the bottom corner is taken from our evaluation report of the project for the, for the past year. And, and it's one that's kind of replicated in, maybe in different words and sentences, but it's, it's very, very sort of typical of the thing that we get from a large portion of our volunteers. So um, the South Downs Research Group, this is these guys here, and they were formed on the back of Citizen. Um, they took up their own group, they set up their own Facebook page, and they now do an awful lot of activities outside of archaeology. And I think this is quite important that archaeology has focused and created a new social group. It's an activity around which they can do other things with those people. So they go out and they work with the National Trust, who are also our project partners. They um, do some work with them on their various estates. They share their finds with people. They are looking uh, for adders in National Trust estates, they're going on the big seaweed hunt as it comes up, and they also like going to look at sheep as well. So they, um, they're a really great group and they're really active, but they came about because of the Citizen Project really. Um, sorry, wafting that has blown my mind. <laughs> um, and a couple of the other ladies in there also go dancing together, they go out drinking together, that kind of thing. So that's been a really good, good anchor for us for the project to take them through to this. Now, if anyone wanted to say that a um, certain generation didn't involve themselves with technology, um, this picture hopefully starts to prove it wrong. This is a picture of all of the group looking at their phones or tablets because they're using our brand new app. And this is the data side of the project, <laughs> I should mention. Um, what you see here is our interactive map that you can look at on our website. It has many, many thousands of points <coughs> all around the coast of the UK. Uh, England, sorry, um, you click on one of those points and it will tell you a site, a feature, or if it's a fine spot, for example, that has been 
located in, uh, at that point, and that information is taken from various different sources. And what you can see here, there's one green dot. That green dot went on that map the day after we ran the session with that group. That green dot represents a new citizen feature that has been added to our database. Um, and what this map provides is a very accessible and very almost real time. We update this weekly with the feed that comes in from our volunteers. They get to see the results of their work on a map. They get to see the information they've provided, photographs, anything like that, the description. They can then update that information and that's our monitoring phase of the project. They go back and they take more pictures at regular intervals. That person owns that little stretch of the coastline, if you will, in their mind. I mean, it's, we don't say that they own it, but we can provide them and guide them on sectors that they can patrol. We give them something that's theirs to monitor. And that has been and um, will continue to be something that's very important. People really like to feel like they're engaged with that part of their local uh, locality where they are. And that data once here will get fed to the ADS. Out I'm out of time. Oh, it's a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's a good one to end on. And um, that's our app. You can download it if you like. Um, I'd love to speak to you more about it, but perhaps we can talk about it a bit later on. <laughs> right. Uh, thanks, Al. <laughs> Very comprehensive. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's all great. You've done your. You've got your HLF project, TDP, which basically is a a community archaeology project looking at the intertidal archaeology of the Thames. Uh, we were HLF funded for three years. So what happens when the uh, big money tap runs out? Um, does the project have to die? Uh, not necessarily, and in our case, uh, it didn't. Thankfully, we found a, a very generous sugar daddy in uh, the form of Mola, who very generously host us, uh, and basically are a fallback for the project. Obviously, we can use their resources. But at the end of the day, having a host is neither here nor there. What keeps it going is the volunteers. And because we've got a lot less money than we had before, uh, the staff has gone down from four and a half members of staff to one and a half for a lot of the last four years. So the people who stepped into the breach are the volunteers. They've taken ownership of their sites. Um, and not only in terms of regular monitoring visits and telling us what's going on, but some of them have even been directing the field work now. So sites where I would have walked down and said, we're going to do this, this and this, I now turn up and go, what would you like us to do? How can we help? And I think it's, it's devolving that power down to them. And now it's very much more a bottom up run organisation. Uh, and it's increasingly so. Um, revenue strands are very important. As I say, Mola support us, but we have to find money from someone we can't afford to cost them too much money. So we now unfortunately charge for training. It used to be free. Uh, a four-day training course costs £100, £50 if you're on wage. Sadly, we'd like it to be free, but we do have to uh, charge, unfortunately. Um, we do heritage tourism, a little bit of it. This uh, is in Darking, East London. You may know it well. Uh, we, we have done uh, some elements of heritage tourism uh, with people like Andante Tours and also with foreign tour groups, and that brings in another revenue strand. We do a lot of guided walks to the general public. And again, not only us. Uh, this is Helen, this is one of our volunteers. She's leading a guided walk for us. And again, so it's all about bringing the volunteers to the front. It's their project much more than ours. We are, we are support for them. Uh, we also do a little bit of commercial work, for example, where they're doing uh, repairs to the river wall. Uh, and that obviously brings in a bit of funding. And we spend an awful lot of time fundraising. Um, uh, Helen, who I just mentioned, who was a volunteer, as a result of a, a grant from the City Bridge Trust, is now, has now got a post with us for three years. So in terms of the earlier session, uh, a month ago she was one of them, now she's one of us. She's the same person. Uh, and also we had uh, a, a year's grant for a post from CBA, thank you very much Mike, a couple of years ago. And uh, various other funding bodies. So we do an awful lot of fundraising these days. How do we disseminate? Because again, less staff, uh, less money, etc, etc. <laughs> We try and do a lot, put a lot on the website, and again, it's not just ours, it's the volunteers' work, predominantly. Uh, we do a lot uh, of lectures, and we also have an annual conference, which is open to the public. And we've now, again, got funding now for us to actually publish a book through these lovely people. The last book written about the archaeology of the Thames is 60 years old this month, has never been done since. So again, and as part of the book, we want as many contributions from the volunteers in as possible. So again... To sum up, really, 
Um, it's not about us, it's, it's about them. It's, and and who, are, who are us and who are them? The, you know, as this project has grown, um, they have taken more and more ownership. Indeed, we now have a thing called a Frog Council. It's never even telling us how we should run the project. And I'm hoping that is really is the core of the sustainability of our project. And I hope that will happen with Owls and everyone else's as well. Thank you. Thank you.